Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Brittany Zimmerman to the show. She is the CEO of Yummy, an organization developing technology for living in space, as well as preserving our environment right here on Earth. But first, we look in on the Hubble Space Telescope as that famed instrument powers down following a computer failure. Next, we look at a new study examining the causes of the recent dimming of the red giant star Betelgeuse. Finally, we journey out to a pair of distant galaxies that appear to be missing a crucial ingredient, dark matter. Now, on June 13th, the Hubble Space Telescope shut itself down following the failure of critical electronics aboard the 30-year-old orbiting telescope. A payload computer designed in the 1980s gave out, and the main computer aboard Hubble ordered a shutdown. However, Hubble is equipped with several redundant systems, and the teams at NASA and the Goddard Space Flight Center are hard at work developing workarounds to bring this remarkable space telescope back online. The red giant star Betelgeuse dimmed over several months at the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020 leading many people to speculate that it might be on the verge of erupting as a supernova explosion. However, a new study from the European Southern Observatory lends additional evidence to earlier findings showing that this dimming may be the result of a cloud of dust formed from gas ejected from this star. As the gas expanded and cooled, the gas solidified into a dark dust, blocking our view of the southern hemisphere of this mighty star. We talked with Dr. Stella Kafka, CEO of the American Association of Variable Star Observers, about this new study. And so there was recently a new study came out that looked at what's going on with Betelgeuse. And can you tell us, just give us a brief intro to that and what was found. So this particular study is not necessarily telling us um, something extraordinarily difficult, but it fills in the gap in, um, in, de in terms of details of what happened during that episode of Betelgeuse. Uh, that particular study was uh, conducted using a very specialized instrument in one of uh, the Southern Hemisphere large telescopes that managed to actually generate a, let's see, a two-dimensional picture of the brightness, surface brightness of Betelgeuse, so what we can see. Uh, and the data were collected before the, the minimum of the dimming, during the minimum of the dimming, actually right smack at the very minimum and during recovery. So this particular study managed to actually build a little movie of that material as it actually condensed and covered that side of Betelgeuse um, that was between us and the line of sight. And uh, as, as the, the material, the, the dust dissolved a little bit. So it's, it's what we were talking about before. Um, you're looking at the same problem with different goggles, with different instruments, and you're revealing something different. So you just, this is another piece of the puzzle that it will help us understand the physics uh, and the mechanics of this kind of uh, ejection phenomena from Betelgeuse. And stars like that, of course, right? Fabulous. Join us on July 13th for the full interview with Dr. Kafka as she tells us all about Betelgeuse. And don't say it three times. Dark matter, which makes up roughly a quarter of all the matter and energy in the cosmos, is thought to be prevalent in and around all galaxies. 
In 2018, however, a team of astronomers reported finding a galaxy which seemed to be nearly free of this mysterious invisible substance. Now, the same astronomers report finding a second galaxy possessing very little dark matter. Both of these families of stars are roughly as large as the Milky Way, but contain just 1% of the mass of our home galaxy. Further investigations will examine these unusual galaxies attempting to learn about their formation. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Brittany Zimmerman, CEO of Yome, on her work developing technology for space exploration and protecting the Earth from environmental catastrophe. This week on an extraordinarily hot uh, episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. We're, oh, we're delighted to be joined by Brittany Zimmerman. She is CEO and Chief of Innovation for Yame, mm -hmm. an organization dedicated to advancing space exploration as well as solving our myriad of problems here at home. Welcome to the show, Brittany. Oh, thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. Great. Um, you know, it seems we're really at a unique crossroads for humanity now. You know, we're mm -hmm. moving out into space, leaving the cradle of our of our home planet for the first time while we face se several existential challenges here at home. Mm -hmm. And so how does how does space exploration help us here on Earth? So I love this question. And if you look at kind of my tagline for Yame, it is celestial and terrestrial sustainability. So I see these two industries and endeavors tied very, very closely. Um, and some may agree and some may not, but <laughs> this is my personal take on it. You know, both, of, both Earth and space are extremely human in, in the way that I see it. One is our genetic desire to explore, map the world around us and understand, right? And here on Earth, we face a lot of issues that are more survivability type questions, right? And there has been just a massive amount of, I believe, uh, needed funding put into the space in, the space industry. But so many positive things have really come out of that that have been beneficial for terrestrial humanity, right? Velcro, <laughs> telephones. <laughs> Memory foam mattresses. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, the list is, it's, it's huge, right? A lot of the developments that we come up with are, are, are originally innovated for space travel. The really important thing we need to make sure we're doing is bridging the gap between the two industries. So a lot of people will ask like, how is it okay to spend money right in this specific endeavor when we have stuff going on here? And it is only okay to do it, I believe, if we're sharing the technologies that we've developed the methodologies, right, the philosophies, everything that we really develop in terms of that space travel and share that with the terrestrial humanity. Because right now, 100% of us still live on planet Earth, uh, minus a couple astronauts on the ISS, right? <laughs> <laughs> and but, the Chinese space station now as well. Yes, yes, exactly. And the Chinese space station. So yeah, um, I, 
I can't imagine not doing space exploration as humanity. Um, and I can't imagine us not relying on the people of Earth, right, that are still here right now for a lot of the knowledge that we need for that space exploration. And likewise, the people on Earth need the people in space to, to give back in the opposite direction. And I think this is just my belief in taking a multi-pronged approach to any problem, right? If you have 50 people from the same background, it's a lot harder to solve a problem than if you have 50 people from completely different backgrounds. And this is kind of what the space industry allows for in terms of development uh, for terrestrial stuff. And I mean, that's one of the reasons I've taken a very large step in that direction with EMA and making sure that we do bridge that gap. Because for space development, we know how to make potable water out of human feces, out of human urine, out of in situ resource utilization of regolith, right? We can pull potable water out of these resources. There's no reason anybody on earth should not have access to clean drinking water when they have access to their own urine and they have access to their own feces, right? In that sense, there's no shortage of those things. So we have developed a lot of these techniques for these closed loop systems that are so applicable to, to so many of those existential crises that we're facing as, as humans, right, as people. And likewise, we've developed many, many systems in spacesuits, right, or spacecraft or in habitats. People, when they breathe, exhale a, 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 a bit of carbon dioxide, right? But the partial pressure of that really does um, increase, you know, uh, as especially quickly in um, small environments, we'll see we'll see we're more sensitive to CO2 than one might imagine, right? In fact, when you're swimming, that that urge to breathe comes from the buildup of CO2. It's not actually a lack of oxygen at that point in time that makes you like <gasps> want to breathe. And we're developing these technologies that can host humanity as a colony on these other celestial bodies and you still have to manage that CO2 somehow. And how applicable is that to our fight for global climate change? Incredibly, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. There has to be this bridge. We have to talk to each other. The only way that one of these two industries, right, becomes a burden is if they're not speaking to one another. So I think it's really our part. We have to do our part in order to make sure that we're sharing that information with the people who need it. That's great. And it seems like when you look at these technologies, it would seem that there would be some sort of dichotomy between systems you would develop for space, let's say a mm -hmm. CO2 scrubber for mm -hmm. use on board a space station or a lunar colony, uh, would be significantly different than something that could be used on a massive scale to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And scalability is a huge thing. So, for example, in a spacesuit or in a very, very small single person spacecraft or, you know, smaller volumes, you could use really typical like sorbent or scrubbers using absorption technologies. You could use lithium hydroxides, things along those nature. But just like you say, when you scale that up to something larger, right, you're talking multiple crew members, larger volumes, small habitats. You're really looking at Sabatier style reactors and other other technologies that we are currently using. But then when you talk about scaling again, right, to the very large uh, colonization style um, architectures, you really need to you need to address the fact that there is a humongous parallel with something of that size and right. and Earth, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely. Um, there is a dichotomy. But there is, it's a Venn diagram. It's an, it's an overlapping Venn diagram and parts of it are useful and parts of it aren't. So it's making sure that we get the lessons learned out of a lot of that and, and we're applying it and giving those lessons learned to the people in the respective industries who can do something big about it. Hmm. And it seems that Yame on, their, on your website um, mentions three major goals, which mm -hmm. are carbon capture, Mm -hmm. providing clean drinking water to people mm -hmm. and education. Can, yes. you, can you tell us, a, just a, give us a brief rundown of how you're looking to accomplish those goals? 
Yes, so first for carbon capture, um, we are registered in the XPRIZE competition. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. We actually think that the system that we're pulling together will probably be a little more encompassing than just uh, everything that's in scope for the XPRIZE. Um, but it's really an exciting effort. Uh, I think we have over 50 people right now. Um, almost half of those people have their PhDs in, in, in completely different fields. Um, most people have their masters. But we're also taking on people into the team who are coming out of high school, who are still in their careers, in their undergraduates program. And it's so exciting because it's like, oh, I've always loved AI and robotics and I, I have this desire to learn more about XYZ. I heard so-and-so is on the team and I would really like to be a part of that. So we can kind of bring them onto our AI group, right? And they get to work with leading experts in the field, which is awesome. I mean, they get to contribute to a project that is helping solve a global problem at the same time as them being educated and kind of coached and mentored in the field that they're specifically interested in jumping into. Likewise, we have a lot of the similar things. We have people in Benin, Africa, right? That are really interested in space style stuff. So we get to pair them up with people who like have worked at NASA, right? And, right, it, right. and it's really exciting for everybody in this because it's extremely fulfilling for both ends. So we really are ta taking the outreach part of this as almost an inherent part of what we're doing, right? There's no sense in developing technologies that there isn't a cultural acceptance for as well. So we're putting a lot of time and effort into looking at if we want to develop technologies X, Y, and Z, we need to be in a geographical location that has access to these geo formations. Where does that put us in the world? Okay, so then we get to look at that part of the world and we're like, what are the cultures there? Do they accept these types of technologies? Because you can see, we can we can generate a brand new style of nuclear reactor. We could do it with thorium and we can tell people that there's no inherent risk and there is no meltdown, but they've already have it in their brain. The seed's been planted, then nuclear is a problem, right? So it doesn't matter how technologically sound, right, your ideas are, if there isn't that sort of social license and cultural acceptance of what you're trying to do as well. So it's all about, is us educating ourselves on a lot of these places and a lot of these cultures and luckily on the team we have between 10 and 20 different countries who are participating uh, on our team right now so just making sure that we get a really good feel of a those countries but b the countries that were interested in placing a lot of these technologies and c globally there's a lot of countries that might not directly affect but when you're talking about something that has such a large impact on the globe you have to bring everybody into this conversation you don't get to do a nationalistic approach to solutions like this this right. has right. to be everybody yeah. absolutely so, and speaking of everybody joining in uh you have a give earth some love drive yeah. where people can participate directly in your projects can you tell us a little bit about that yeah absolutely so we're like i said i think it takes a village so we want to give her some love there are certain types of activities where collaboration is absolutely necessary and i think there's <coughs> no better example of that than the space industry right absolutely. so for short-term missions, the moon, we've talked about the space race, tons, right? For some of those those ambitious goals that are more surmountable, the competition drives innovation. That's a fantastic thing. But as we move further and further into space, what we're trying to accomplish becomes greater and greater. And you have to lean more and more in, on collaboration. When we're talking about global climate change, this isn't a silver bullet sort of issue you know like there is not going to be a solution that is a silver bullet they say right. one person did not screw up one time and that's why we're in the situation that we're in lots of people over lots of time in many <laughs> different ways screwed this up for us right and so it's going to take a system level approach to make a massive difference at these large scales so really that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take that approach we're pulling together all of these different ideas we're evaluating it and it's so fun because you can, we have people who will pick and choose, right? 
we're all a tiny little piece of this large puzzle. So a thermodynamicist might come up with a very strange way of of carbon capture through direct air capture, right? People right. in the industry might be like, I've never seen anything like this before. What are you doing? So it's really fun for them because it kind of re-inspires them because they've been in the industry for so long and they're getting to see new technologies. Yeah. And at the same time, there's a lot of people who are new into the field who love their knowledge because they've had these lessons learned that they can feed into some of these things that we're doing. So yeah, right now, um, the give love some earth is a very much like we need experts we have tons of them on the team but we need everybody else too so you do not have to be an expert to join the experts right so it's a really fun activity where everybody's voice gets to be heard we get to collaborate in this synergistic environment that is so beautiful it is my favorite group i've ever done a lot of innovation with many yeah. people in the group i've developed many technologies with we're co-inventors on a lot of patents so we've sort of worked through that but now we're adding all these additional people into that process that we've taken so many times as our own small group together that it is exciting and it is thrilling and it is fun i think for everybody because we get all these new ideas that we get to bounce around but a lot of people who have joined the team are in academia and have these great ideas that they just don't know how to bring to the real life. So we have technologists as well who help us take those ideas, right? We have tons of experience in order to kind of bridge that gap. And okay, these are great ideas. How do we flush that out? How do we go through the R&D process? How do we end up with something that actually can make a global change? Is it pragmatic? Is it economical? Is it technically doable? It's all of these things together, right? And it's really exciting. So yeah, right now we just, we're just, anybody who's a good person can join the team really, right? As long as the culture remains a collaborative and safe place, we want everybody's ideas to come together to help us form something that we think is going to make a global impact and really make a difference to shift people's thought process from being one of this, the resources around us are something that we've inherited and we have some rights to and help sh help shift that into more of a, we've borrowed this land from the people who will be here later. Let's try not to screw it up so that they don't have something to survive with. That's fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Brittany. It was a delight talking with you. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. And that was Brittany Zimmerman, CEO and Chief of Innovation for Yummy. Next week, we'll be joined by Alyssa Mills. She is a graduate student at the University of Alabama. And we're going to talk about her work studying the largest moon of the solar system, Ganymede. Be sure to visit with us then. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP memberships, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube. Facebook video or any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit CosmicCompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Hmm.